Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we proceed in our study, going over these articles of Uriah Smith's on the books of Daniel, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his blessing, and for him to show us that which he would have us to understand today. Let us now approach the throne of grace and ask that he has control of this study and opens our minds so that we might more fully understand. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you, Father, for the tests and the trials that have come before us. We thank you because we understand that is it is those that you love, that you discipline, and on which tests and trials will occur. Help us now, Father. Direct us and guide us. Show us, Father, that which you would have us to do. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit open our minds. We ask that your angels attend us. Be with us in this conversation, in this study, so that we may more properly glorify your character and your name. We thank you for those that cannot be with us today and that will view this later. Direct us now. Be with us, we ask, for we need you in all ways and in all things. Thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name we praise you. Amen. Now, as we return to this in the book of Daniel, this particular article covers a total of three verses. So we start with verse 14. And in those times there shall be many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the cow zone, but they shall fall. Now, as we looked over Eugene Pruitt's articles previously, as we are looking at this with Uriah Smith now, Have we found any evidence at this point that these commentators have understood that Daniel is being shown that the larger vision, the calzone, the 2520, is what Gabriel is instructing Daniel in? Because we're not, we're not speaking here of the Maref. The vision that is true, the visions of the evening and the morning. We are speaking of the calzone. Right. So, I mean, it's something that um, we, before we got into this in-depth study of Daniel 11, we never really considered which which vision it was. Right. right. So, right. You know, in the past, in this message, even though we understood the 2520, when it says, also the robbers of that people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, we we... We didn't really think about what that what that word was. At least I don't remember us discussing it prior to this in-depth study. And and especially since when we're looking at this, the context is the the understanding of you know the kazone, right? I mean, based upon what we saw in chapter ten, because verse one, where he already understood the Mara, right? He already understood the Debar, right? but he doesn't have an understanding of the Kazon. And then that's clearly made in, in chapter 10, verse 14. Now am I come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Right. So it, it's clear then that the understanding of the Kazon is the whole point. And so this gives more emphasis upon verse 14 um, than what we had previously to this study. That's the emphasis of the Kazon. Now, we also know that the robbers of thy people, which we have understood to be a reference to pagan Rome. So Rome comes in, pagan Rome, to establish the vision. And we also have looked at um, some of the symbolism in there uh, and, and the main symbolism for me is we've taken the Hebrew uh, numbers for the phrase robbers, which is actually two different Hebrew words, and um, and that is uh, let me see here maybe which a footnote that's well, not a footnote it's right in the brackets so H one one two one plus H six five three zero those two numbers added together equal H7651, which is the Hebrew Sheba seven times in Leviticus 26. 
So, <laughs> so I, I mean, to me, that's just really remarkable. It, it's one of the, the strongest, especially when we add like two numbers together like that. It, we had a similar thing when we added together. It was in the book of Judges. We were adding together uh, Jephthah and Shibboleth, and that gave us, um, I don't remember what, what number it gave us. While, he, while he's looking, I'll tell you about the verse 17 in chapter 8. I mean, right. that, that's uh, okay. That, that's uh, um, the uh, the coordinates, the, the um, because it is it, it's a zone in the seventeen, but in the concordance, it's more. They put it as four right. five eight. Yeah. Okay. So so just to reference this, so Daniel eight verse seventeen, which in reverse is July eighteen, right? Right. In that verse, so he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. And um, that's the that's so, cozone. That's the cozone vision. Right? Yeah, and you're saying in yeah, that's the cozone. But you're saying in the hard copy of Strong's, it says uh, the Mara. Right. That's right. That's right. It says Amara. That's right. Right. Yeah. So that's what I thought. And and so that created some confusion back in the old days before we had the internet, before we had all these computer softwares. Um and, and the only reason why I could tell it was different though is if I looked at the Hebrew itself as uh, not his own, but Mara. Right. So, so th thanks for doing that there um, for us, William. But, but it's kind of interesting that it's in that verse that's the reverse of July 18, um, because it does give us significance then as a symbol regarding the, the significance of the zone there in the context of what we're studying here. Now, in chapter 8, what he says so, so the significance there is that we have in Daniel chapter 8, he's going to say in verse 16, I heard a man's voice between the banks of, of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Now, that's going to be Mara, right? So in order to understand the 2300 days, which is the Mara vision, the angel then is going to come near that is Gabriel, he comes near to where, where Daniel stands, right? And he says, understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision, right? So he is not, he's not directly answering that question with that vision. He's, he's going to say, to understand the 2300 days, you need to understand the kazone, correct? I would agree. I would yeah. agree too. Yeah, and then he needs to understand what the time of the end is. So, so to me, this is really, really significant. And then in 818, he's going to be touched. So he's right. going to touch me and say, oh, right. Now, so in Daniel chapter 10, you're going to have the three touches. But you have a touch in chapter 8, a touch in chapter 9. Uh, I think it's 9 verse 26. No, not 26, 9 verse the one where he gets touched. Uh, yeah, 9 verse 21. Yeah, that makes more sense. And then um, and then in chapter 10, he's going to be touched three times, um, which is kind of like the three angels' messages in reverse, because in the first angel's message, all three messages are contained. Um, in this one, the third time, the third time he's going to be, the third vision of groups, he's going to be touched three times in that one. And it's going to be illustrating the three angels' messages. So this, the, this is tying this together with the thread. And that thread is the understanding of these visions, uh, the 2300 days and the 70 weeks, which he, he now understands in chapter 10. But now he's going to be given the understanding of the kazone, which helps bring it all together. 
Um, so then in chapter 11, verse 14, we see then the real significance that it is Rome that establishes the vision. That is, it exalts itself to establish the vision. And one of the things we discussed about that was that Rome itself is not doing this so that it can establish the vision, like in its own will and its own int intent, because Rome isn't thinking about the zone at all. So, so God is behind this, right? That we under we discussed that before. Does that make sense? So they're going to exalt themselves, but this for the purpose in God's hands, God's purposes, God's providence to establish the vision. But in exalting themselves, they shall fall. So, so this isn't about Rome exalting itself for a purpose in and of themselves. This is God allowing them to exalt themselves to establish the kazon. And so I think there's, there's so much significance in this verse that we have not seen before. Um, and it's just such a simple thing, looking at the Hebrew word. When we begin to consider carefully that what we have here in effect, are, are three different types of experiences that are denominated by three different types of, of visions. Can we make the application that these visions are a symbol of the steps into and through the sanctuary? Okay, so that's an interesting idea. So if we're going to do that, uh, we also have a fourth. And we know that the fourth is the second. Right. Right? Correct. So we, so we would have to argue that uh, because it's going to be the Mara, right? So we have the Mara and the Mara. And the Mara is the looking glass vision. And that would represent our history. Would we agree with that? The fourth angel's message. The I'm second just... angel being. Okay. So that means that the Mara, the 2300 days, would have to symbolize uh, the second angel's message because they're obviously related words. One's masculine, one's feminine, uh, for the same, same Hebrew word. And then we would, we would have to say that uh, the, the other ones that we have are the 70 weeks and the Kazon. And one of those would be the first angel's message and the other one would be the third. Now, which one would we have as the first angel and why? I would almost always be looking at it as the Kazon is the first angel's message. Okay. And why? <clears throat> because it contains the elements of the other two. Oh, okay. Okay. I never thought of that reason. Okay. So it contains, yeah, because the other ones are part of they're a different portion of the same great prophetic period. That is the right. 70 weeks and the 300 days of both. The okay. So I never thought of that. Now, uh, the reason why I would put it is I would look at chapter seven, even though it's in um, uh, Aramaic and it has uh, two, three, uh, seven, six instead of two, three, seven, seven. It's still basically the same word. And right. that's going to be the first one introduced. And then the Maraz chapter eight. That's the second and 70 weeks uh, of Daniel chapter 9. That's going to be, so that doesn't work. So I guess the, yeah, so that's the Mara. Yeah. And then, and then Daniel 9 is going to be, let me see, how do we get that? So we got Mara, that's the, that's the 2300 days. Yeah. And then Daniel 9, the 70 weeks. Uh, let me see. What's the word there? We got. Kazon, Mare, my mind's going blank. Which, now that's going to be, in Daniel 9, so, what, what verse are you looking at? Because that one's going to be called the matter or the debar. So, so we got, we got, okay, so we got Kazon, Mara, and then we have the debar. So that's not, not a vision, but that is the, uh, the commandment. If you're looking at 923, then this, as you, as you come through this, yes, the matter, the Debar, Hebrew 1697, is shown. Because yeah. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth. The Debar came forth. 
and I am come to shew thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the debar and consider the mare. Right. So the mare is the 2300 days. So, so we have the kazon, the mare, the mara, and the debar. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so those are, um, and so that's the order in which they're given, right? The zone, mare, the bar, and then the fourth one is the mar, the mara. Okay. Right? The looking glass. So that's the order they're given in. So that to me would make sense that that's first, second, third, and then the fourth. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. So, so that's what that that's what I was thinking the answer would be. But the idea that the kazone contains the first or the second and the third is is just as valid, right? So both of those are correct answers. So so we did that correct. That makes sense to everyone. Nobody has problems with that. Maybe once I wake up some more. Okay. So so just simply we have four different words that are describing four different visions. We have kazone, which describes the 2520, and and that's going to be first mentioned in Daniel chapter 7, as far as these visions are concerned. I mean, in a sense, Daniel chapter 2 is also addressing that, but it doesn't have the word, you know, 2, 3, 7, 6. So in chapter 7, you're definitely having uh, the kazone being mentioned. And so in chapter 8, when it talks about uh, the kazon, it obviously is referring to chapter 7, right, in the context of introdu introducing the 2300 days. And then you're going to have, uh, in chapter 8, you're going to have the devar, that's the matter or the commandment, or the thing, right, it's all the same Hebrew word. It says he had the understanding of the thing, that's he could have said matter or he had understanding of the, the commandment in chapter uh, in chapter 10. So that that is uh, the topic of chapter nine. So that's the 70 weeks is given that phrase, the debar. Um, so that's going to be the third one, right? So you've got the kazone, the mara, the debar, and then you have the mara. So it's A-H instead of E-H. Mara. Ph Mara, the looking glass is AH. And um, so that's going to be the fourth angel's message. And it's a repeat of the second, but it empowers the third, right? That's why the fourth angel arrives. It joins with the third. And so it parallels what we've already understood about the first, second, and third angel's messages in military history. Now, also another Another point is in Millerite history, if we're going to look at the first, second, and third angels' message, well, what message do they understand in Millerite history first? What does Miller first find? The 2520? Yeah. Yeah. That's what he's first going to find is the 2520. He doesn't find the 2300 days. Or the 1335 first, he's going to find the 2520. And then in the, in the second angel's message, the emphasis that, or the key uh, for Samuel Snow is going to be an understanding of the midst of the week. So the midst of the week, that's, that's going to be the, the second angel's message, right? And then, but, but we would also have to put the, the 2300 days in there as well. So, um, so he first studied, first understands the 2520. And then, uh, the, the second angel's message is going to be the hour of God's judgment is come. So how would we fit in, um, the midst of the week under the second angel? So, so we have, uh, the 2520 first. Then the second angel's, I guess the way to look at it is the second angel's message is going to be tying together the 70 weeks and the 2300 days. I don't know if that, that makes sense or not. 
because in the first angel's message, okay, so William Miller's going to have three different uh, visions, and they're, he's going to have the twenty, the twenty-five twenty, the thirteen thirty-five, and the twenty-three hundred days. But I think the order in which he finds those is um, first, of course, the twenty-five twenty, then the twenty-three hundred days, then. He doesn't have an understanding of the 70 weeks. That's going to be Samuel Snow. But that's going to lead to the October 22nd, 1844 date. So how would we how would we address that? So would we say the 2520 then is the first, the 2300 days is the second? Because the 1335 isn't one of these visions. And then the one that leads to the start of the third angel's message is uh, the understanding of the midst of the week. So does that fit the pattern, or is there a problem there? I know it's a little bit of close thinking. Because Samuel Snow is going to be the one who has an understanding of the Debar. Right? He's going to introduce that in Miller as his truth. Miller never understands the 70 weeks, the midst of the week. And it's not, it's not really one of his principal prophetic periods. That is, Miller uses the 70 weeks to give the starting point for the 2300 days. But he doesn't fully understand the 70 weeks. He has Christ crucified at the end of the 70 weeks in uh, 33 AD. So he doesn't even have him crucified in the midst of the week. So that's going to be Samuel Snow. Just an odd question. question. Yeah. Odd, odd question, perhaps. Uh, is this where the evangelicals uh -huh. get their, or no, it's not evangelicals, the midst of the week. People getting the idea that Christ was crucified on a Wednesday. Is that part of what, what they use? Um mean cut off in the midst of the week? I only know I only know of one Wednesday crucifixion who tries to use that week to refer to the week weeks of days. Uh, because it's it's a bit of a problem. So uh I mean because yeah. you're gonna take the seventy weeks or weeks of years. So obviously that week is a period of seven years. Right, but the well, midst of the week, they they must not you they must not apply that day for a year. Or, they must take it as a literal week or something. No, no. So so no. the only I only know one one Wednesday crucifixion person who who says the midst of the week that means it has to be Wednesday. Okay. But I only, and that's, yeah, and that's I, just I just thought it might be one of their logic, one of their conclusions. Okay, uh, just an aside. Yeah, I mean there might be more. But I, I've never seen a Wednesday crucifixion per person other than this one guy who's just really out, out there, uh, you know, try to apply it both ways. But, you know, there might be other people who make that argument, but you don't generally see that. But, uh, yeah, so the midst mm -hmm. of the week is in the, midst of, of the 70th week of years. Now, mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, most well, people don't try to do it. But anyway, the, getting back to this point, or do you have a question, William? Well, I was going to, yeah, before I forget it, I was going to, I don't know if y'all noticed it before, but Daniel 8, 2, it's got a double end with the post on vision, but then it's got also got a double end with the, um, I looked up the MRA and it had a, where it said it, 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 it was from 7, 7200. And I went and looked him up, and it's got it three times in Daniel two, Daniel eight two. Yeah. So you're saying, um, and I saw yeah. in a vision. That's when I saw that I was in Shushan, the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw it in a vision, and I was out oh. by the river Yu, right? And then you're saying the word saw. Saw oh, is, is the a vision a, twice. Vision yeah. twice, so it's coupled in that verse, and the word saw seven two zero zero. Is yep. is tripled. That's right. right. And that I, I just, saw when I yeah. saw. I just noticed it was a double and and a triple in that verse. I just wanted to share it. I don't know if it means anything, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know, uh, but it is interesting. That's a nice pickup. Okay. Yeah, it's you know when we're looking at that from Daniel eight two, to see that Daniel Ra'a saw in a vision but that vision in both both of those times is Calzone. Yeah. So he's being shown this 
calzone after the fall of Babylon because there was no palace in Sushan at the time of Belshazzar. Right. And yeah, so Daniel's being brought into the future. Right. Now, it's interesting, too, if you look at 8 verse 1 and 8 verse 2. <clears throat> so it says, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, in a vision, that is a kazon, right. appeared, appeared, that word appeared is the same one I saw. Right. Right. So 7200. Unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. So now they could have. Right. So the word appeared can be translated as as saw. And the word vision can also be translated as appearance, at least the Mara one was and could be. Right. So, so we have all of these words, which all have to do with appearances or visions. Um, it's kind of interesting that they, that they just are packed together in those first two verses, which really is emphasizing the kazon. And and with this word appeared, now then when you get to, uh, you know, because you're not going to get Mara until verse 16 as the word vision, right? So 8 verse 16. Uh, But in 8 verse 15, you're going to have Mara introduced me, introduced. So it says, it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision, the kazong, and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. So that word appearance is going to be marat, right? And, and so he's going to have the marat. And then it says, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the marat. And then in verse 17, he says, so he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand the Son of Man, for at the time of the end shall be the Kazon. So these are really important details that really their importance is seen as you go through these visions and you get to chapter 10, verse 14, and then chapter 11, verse 14. So now if we finally start to understand the significance of Rome exalting itself to establish the vision. But in, in English, you wouldn't notice any of this. And, and most, most theologians or translators are not going to see any significance in these changes of, of Hebrew words, right? They're not going to attach them to the different types of prophetic periods. Exactly. Now, you're going to get some who might say in chapter 8, oh, you know, there's these two different words. And the visions of the evenings and morning, that's referring to the 2300 days, right? Correct. That is the the Mara, right? So, I I mean, I noticed this back uh, studying on my own without any help from anybody, just my concordance in the Holy Spirit. When I first started studying this, chapter 8, I noticed that because I had my concordance and I had my interlinear. I had my youngs, my strongs, my interlinear, and my spirit of prophecy books. But I noticed this, right? And then I noticed after I had found it that other people had noticed it. So I knew that the the Mara was the 2300 days. But we now, we didn't know what the Kazon was, right? That was the thing that we didn't know. And definitely we didn't attach the Debar to the 70 weeks and the Mara to the, the looking glass vision. We didn't see that as a different vision we would just oh that's well at least i would say you know that's just the feminine feminine form of the 2300 days but if we understand this now so what we're saying is that the the 2300 days represents the second angel's message right and and in millerite history that's going to be you know miller's going to proclaim you know that he's going to find first the the kazone and his focus is upon that zone. And the 2300 days and the 70 weeks are a part of it, right? So they're all a part of that. But it's going to be then uh, the 70th week. So we're going to have then the Marah. So we got the, the Debar. 
Uh, the 70th week, that's what Samuel Snow is going to be pointing to. That is, he's going to have that key there, understanding 70th week. That's the third angel's message, right? We're saying 70, the Debar represents the third angel's message. But it's going to be in connection with the 2300 days. So I'm not sure exactly how we, we sort that out in, in Millerite history. But we would say that, you know, Samuel Snow is going to give the date, October 22nd, 1844, for the cleansing of the sanctuary. And, and that's the second angel's message. So we know that in, for Miller, he never understood the cleansing of the sanctuary being in the heavenly sanctuary. But Samuel Snow is going to uh, point to the date of the cleansing of the sanctuary or uh, the proclamation of the second angel's message, right? And that becomes really significant. Without Samuel Snow's proclamation of the second angel's message as occurring on the Day of Atonement, you wouldn't have the significance of Christ moving from the holy to the most holy place at the end of the prophetic periods, right? Agreed. Yeah. So, and, and, and we have to think about this. So Miller's, Miller's uh, prediction initially is just about the year 1843. Now, then he, he's going to refine that in December of 1842 to be from the spring of 1843 to the spring of 1844, using March 21st as the date. Right, so in to our calendar, he's just going to use the equinoxes, basically, the the spring equinox. Now, now later they're going to they're going to establish that uh, that the first day of the first month isn't the spring equinox. It happens to be that uh, for the Jewish calendar in 1844, but obviously not for 1843. Um, so as they continue to refine this, um, we know that that Miller is then going to Attach the fall types in the fall of 1843. Well, it's going to be actually in May of 1843. He's going to say that the fall types in 1843, that Christ maybe could come in connection with the fall types. But Christ doesn't come in the fall of 1843. And, and you could call that a disappointment. I think for Samuel Snow it was because he really uh, looked to the fall types. He could see the significance of how that would tie to the cleansing of the sanctuary. So he begins a study of that. Uh, he gives his personal testimony on December 31st, 1843, at the Boston Tabernacle, uh, but doesn't tell anybody about his findings that Christ should come back in the fall of 1844. And he decides on January 1st, on the first day of the first month on our calendar, uh, that he's going to make that proclamation. He's going to share that. So he writes a letter uh, dated February 16th, 1844, and he's going to send it to Brother Southern. It's going to be published in February 22nd, 1844, in um, the Midnight Cry uh, periodical. Right? And that's going to be republished again in uh, April 3rd, which is going to be the Jewish Passover. 1844. So anyway, we can see that there is this progression of understanding, but it's the fact that, that the, the second angel's message is going to say that it's going to be on the 10th day of the seventh month, uh, that becomes really important. Now, that's the day of atonement. That's going to be the, the event that's going to um, be repeated in our history in a sense, right? So in Millerite history, it's going to be about the beginning of the Day of Atonement. That's the second angel's message. That's going to be the Mara, right? Is that making sense? All that talking. In our history, it's going to be the Mara. So one thing that we can say about the Mara is it marks the beginning of the of the Day of Atonement, the end of the 2300 days. And our message, the repeat of the second angel's message, is going to be the Mara which is going to be the judgment moving from the dead to the living. Can we see the significance of this, of why when we have the mighty angel of Revelation 18 come down at 9-11, that this is the judgment of the living? I think we're in the pattern. Pattern. Yeah. So if, if a person agrees that the Sunday law arrives at 9-11, the 
a symbol that the second angel arrives, you would have to then say that the judgment of the living is commencing, right? That's what we teach. Now, but somebody asked me on WhatsApp about this, or maybe it was Facebook Messenger. You know, how do I prove the judgment of the living uh, began at 9-11? But I think this is probably the best answer. Because if we understand that it's the second angel and that it's kind of the, the, the second angel is going to be the message, uh, behold the bridegroom come and kill you and meet him, right, on the 10th, 5th, and 7th month, which is going to be addressing that uh, the closed and open door, right, then in our history, we would have to see that, that obviously, uh, the mighty angel of Revelation to 18, the second angel message coming at 9-11, must be announcing the judgment that, that is moving to the judgment of the living. Does that make sense? Again, I think it fits the pattern. The yeah. point that Miller had not understood, he was looking at the Mare, the 2300 days, the, the vision of the evening morning that is true. He was looking that this was going to be the end of that vision on October 22nd, 1844, instead of the beginning. We're applying that this is the start and that we're living through that day of atonement. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So we're living through that day of atonement, that, which we understand. But it, it, and it first starts with the judgment of the dead. Right. Right. But at a certain point, it moves to the judgment of the living. And the one that moves it to the judgment of the living is the Mara, the looking glass vision. Yes. Agreed. And, now, there's some significance in the looking glass vision that, that, you know, we often don't consider because we know it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. But how is it a revelation of Jesus Christ? Well, one of the things that um, when you look at, at uh, Levit uh, Leviticus, um, Isaiah chapter 8, and you're going to have uh, that great role, right? So moreover, the Lord said unto me, take a great, thee a great role and write in it with a man's pen concerning Maher Shalah Hashbaz, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be this uh, son of Isaiah. Now, that word great role refers to um, a mirror. That is, it's a tablet for writing by analogy, a mirror as a plate, a glass, a roll, right? So th there's two places that occurs in in the Bible, right? So um, it occurs here in Isaiah 8, verse 1, and it also occurs in um, what's the other place. The computer's a bit slow. I have to do it this way. I used to know which verse it was, but I just don't remember. Oh, blocked up. Yeah, it's going to, in Isaiah 3.23, where it's going to talk about uh, the glasses, the fine linen, and the hoods, and the veils, right? So anyway, the word glasses, that refers to uh, mirrors, right? Not to uh, spectacles, okay? So this idea that this is a mirror, that it's this great mirror, this would refer to because uh, remember, in Isaiah chapter 7, it's going to be giving you, in the 65-year prophecy, start of the prophetic mirror, right? Right. Right. When the land that thou, have, that thou hast uh, abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. So it's going to give us, because it's starting at 742. So this, this prophecy is given at the beginning of the prophetic mirror. It's going to refer to this great role, this great mirror, right? And then obviously it's going to be about the prophetic mirror, right? Makes sense. It's going to end in 1863. So the two 2520s. So if we think about the looking glass, uh, the Mar Mara, the revelation of Christ, it's a revelation of Christ in types and symbols in these prophetic periods all coming together. But that that message of these prophetic periods is revealing Christ. Now, you know, there's some discussion here, you know, regarding what is the significance of the chronology um, and of these prophetic periods. 
and and people use a word that I don't like. That is, some people will say it's a test. Okay, so that this chronology, these prophetic periods, you know, the twenty-five twenty, all of this stuff that we've been doing is a test. And and I don't like that word because is not everything in God's word a test? Is not truth itself a test? Yes. Okay. So 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 we know all truth is is a test. Now we will say something like it's something that testing truth. Well, when something becomes a testing truth is when it is made manifest and clear to an individual. Right? That is is the Sunday law a test? Yeah. It's but is it test. right now is it right now a test? No. It becomes yeah. a test when we when we profess or deny it. Okay. Well there's going to be a time in which it becomes a test. You know, I said the Sunday law. I could just say, yeah. is Sunday yeah. a test right now? And when, there's lots of people. And when it's the, not a test. And when the Sabbath is, and when the Sabbath it be, is more fully pro- proclaimed, that's when it becomes a test to the world. So, yeah. So, so I would say that, you know, this chronology right now, it might be a test to certain individuals. Because right. within the move, it has been a test, right? We, we could we could make that argument um, because we, we see the Canadian and American groups, FFA has rejected this chronology. So for them, it was a test. Okay? Right? That, that right. makes sense to people. Yeah, I just, but, I just bring up this quote that Ms. White said that I think it said, those who have, those who have, the light on the Sabbath and who, who, um, and who, um, I don't want to say it, but I can't, I don't want to misquote it, but she says that if, if you have the light on the Sabbath and you choose Sunday over the Sabbath, then you'll probate that, that at that point you have rejected the Sabbath, right? Yeah. I don't think that that I would. <laughs> Yeah, there's more context to it than that. Well, I know it is. Right. I just read. I don't have it at, yeah. at hand right now. But yes, at, it, at, I mean, at a certain point, right? So at a certain point, right? But we need to know who it is. I mean, because God, because God knows the heart, right? But she yeah. she does give strong advice about it. She does say that it, if if you have the light on the Sabbath. And you turn away from that light and choose Sunday. You have received, I think it said, you have received the mark of the beast or something that was like that. Okay, yeah. So yeah, you're not doing a good job paraphrasing it, but I know. I, know. Uh, I, I, that, I think the way you're saying it is wrong. Okay. Okay. So, so yeah. So uh, that is, we need to put it in in uh, in the context. Uh, let me see if I can find the statement here. I just had it. There's quite a few different uh, statements. Yeah, this is Testimonies for the Church, uh, Volume 1, page 78 and 79. I think this is what you're referring to. Um, when we began to present the light on the Sabbath question, is that the one? I don't think that's the one. Let me see if I can. Okay, I think this is the one. When those who hear and see the light on the Sabbath take their stand upon the truth to keep God's holy day, the difficulties will arise. No, that's not the one. Yeah, I don't think there's the statement uh, says what you're saying. And anyway, there, the, when we have the light on the Sabbath, I don't think she says light on the Sabbath. I think that's a different statement. You're mixing some different statements together. But um, the idea is that there comes a time when they receive the mark of the beast. Can somebody receive the mark of the beast now? No, no, it, do, it doesn't become a it doesn't become a mark of the beast until the papacy ascends to the full power it had again. Right. So so it comes at a certain point of history. Now people could close their probation. Uh I mean they could die. Um but they could also close their probation in other ways, right? So people can definitely be going in a direction that they will receive the mark of the beast. Um, but right now we can't really say that there that people are receiving the mark of the beast because there needs to be the Sabbath needs to be proclaimed more fully 
There needs to be this full revelation of light in order for somebody to receive the mark of the beast. Now, what about the seal of God? Can we receive the seal of God now? Now, now we would attach the receiving the seal of God sort of to our probation being closed in some degree. Right. But, you know, I, I don't think... I don't think we can actually receive the seal of God in the way that we understand it, dealing with because that's going to come when we're tested, right? right. We have to pass the code to you. So now, now we what, what just we just, as, <laughs> just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not a seal or a mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come indeed. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receives the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receives the seal of God. It was the time of the third angel's message was closing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, but what, why particularly did we bring up this sealing? How, how does that connect with what we're talking about in in the in the in the sense we were talking about the the end of the judgment and the beginning of the judgment so the beginning of the judgment in of the dead begins october twenty second eighteen forty four we're in the time of the investigative judgment it begins with the dead and then soon how soon we know not Ellen White says we'll then move to the judgment of the living so some people argue we can never know when it moves to the judgment of the living. That is, because Ellen White says, how soon, we don't know. But I would think we can we can just say, since we know that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down, the second angel's message is being repeated, we are in the time of the Sunday law, then we can say that the judgment has moved to the living. Right? That kind of the point? I couldn't disagree. And then, and then we talk about the test. So that's okay. That's where we went to. We went to this test thing. So we would have to say that a testing message, something to be a testing message, must mean that it's seen in its fullness and, and that that opportunity passes. So we're not talking about individuals here. We're just talking about whenever we talk about a probation closing, so to speak, uh, within the movement as a symbol. That just means within this movement, we have had time as a test, right? Right. Okay. So those that ended up rejecting all of the things that pointed to July 18, 2020, they have closed their probation. That, that is, the, the opportunity that they had to see um, this wonderful light that would prepare them for the Sunday law, they have rejected. Now, I'm not talking about the individuals, right? Because there could be individuals who, you know, following Jeff today, who as time goes on, they come to see the light because they didn't see it fully and, and they may be able to stand in the Sunday law, right? I, I can't say that about individuals, but I can say as a general thing within the movement, as a way mark, as a symbol, there is a close of probation that has occurred, right? Okay. Okay. So, so that was a tested testing message for that group of people within this movement. I, I, I don't see how we could avoid that as a symbol, right? Doesn't say anything about individuals. We're not judging any individuals and say that their probation is closed. We can't judge the heart. We can just say within the movement, in that context, there was a closed door. Um, so there was a test. To that chronology now as far as further you know if i if i present the chronology to somebody and they just don't get it and they say i you know and they're they're leery about me they've heard you know like if i teach weird things and they're just not open and listening that they haven't closed their probation they haven't been tested they have to they have to be a part of a revelation of light that they see in some way and then they reject, right? And just because I present something to somebody doesn't mean that they understand it or they're being tested by it. And, and I don't think it's a test for everyone. That is, 
I mean, at some point, there's, there's going to be the Sunday law test. That's going to be the test for the people of God. So we can't argue that, well, every little thing that's ever presented to anybody is a test and people will close their permission if they don't accept something. Because lots of times there's things that we are presented with uh, that we don't see and we might reject, but later on we might accept, right? So to me, a test, when we talk about a test, it involves a close of probation. Does that make sense? To me, a test is when the truth is clear as day and it's rejected. Right. And and it's part of a line that is it's going to be uh, a progression of, of a line that people are involved in. And that's why they can see it clearly. So they're going to see... Um, a revelation of the character of Christ, a manifestation of a one marvelous manifestation of the power of God in some way, and they reject that. But you know, if I give somebody a Bible study on the Sabbath and they they say, oh, I don't believe in the Sabbath, I keep Sunday, but they haven't closed their probation, right? And if that's true, yeah, that means I if agree. I could, yeah, and so then, and if that's true, we that often means reject things we don't understand. Yeah. So if I give somebody a study, you know, somebody comes to the study here on, you know, the Sabbath and, uh, you know, and I present uh, some chronology stuff, but they don't fully understand what I'm doing because they haven't been at all the other studies and they haven't seen light on it. And they just kind of think, oh, you know, that guy's a little bit arrogant. And, uh, you know, I don't like the sound of his voice and I, everything he's saying is just confusion. But they haven't closed their probation, Right. You know, because it's not a test. Now, it's light. There's lots of things that are light. Now, it also could be that that person is open to the Spirit of God and God's working in that person's life, right? So I'm not saying that, you know, that that person isn't spiritual or anything like that. And we, some people would argue, well, if they're really spiritual, they're going to accept all light that's presented to them. But, but that's not necessarily true because, you know, Maybe it's not presented clearly. Maybe they're not ready to receive that light yet. They have to go through some experiences. Not everybody's constituted the same. So, so we can't just say, just because something is truth, if it's presented to somebody, you're being tested by it in every circumstance. Now, it is often true that light does come to people at a time that they're ready to receive it or reject it. And in that, for that individual, there might be a test that God is testing them individually. But we just can't say every time something's presented to something to somebody that's true, that 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 person, in not accepting it right away, has has rejected light and thus closed their probation. Right? So it, it's pretty clear that if we're talking about something being a test, it has to be a test test within a line. And that person has to be a part of that line. They have to be going through that experience. And and the test is, is it the first step? Is a trick question. Is 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 the first angel's message a test? Yes. Okay. So good. Now we know that that probation closed October twenty second, eighteen forty four, for a group of people. And that that closing of that was the rejection of the second angel. But we also know that there was a group that rejected the first angel's message, and and that group uh, closed their probation on April 19th, I mean, actually, probably March 21st, 1844, because for those that uh, accepted the new date, April 19th, they actually had received light that allowed them to go through the tarrying time. So the Protestants closed the door to Miller. Um, some of them, at, you know, December 31st, 1843, because they didn't even ever accept the spring of 1844. They just said, it's 1843, December 31st is come and gone. I'm not really interested in Miller anymore. I think he's a fanatic. Some other people, it's going to be in the spring, March 21st, that their, their probation is going to close, right? So these are Protestants. But, you know, we could say, of course, by April 19th, if, if after April 19th, you have decided that Miller's a fanatic and all this time setting was wrong and we should have known it, and I don't know why I ever followed Miller, they would have closed their probation. 
they're not going to receive the light of the second angel, right? Because they rejected the first. So, so we could argue that there are closes of probation that occur prior to October 22nd, 1844. And, but every little bit of truth is important, but every little bit of truth in and of itself is not a test. It needs to occur on a line. So whether it's, it's a rejection of the first angel, the second, or third, uh, those are all going to be tests, right? Correct. Right. But it needs to be on a line, right? So, um, so there is a line in which chronology is testing people, and that that has passed. So, uh, my argument is that chronology was a test for this movement, but I don't think chronology is going to be a test for Seventh Day Adventists in and of itself, in the way that it was for this movement, because we're not going to be setting a date. But what is going to be a test is the Sabbath, and there is a way in which everything that has happened in Millerite history, being understood in our time, is going to be presented in a way that is going to be a test. So, so it's going to be attached to it in some way, but in a much broader way than just, like, I would never say that all of the light that God has given me is a test for Seventh-day Adventists, that, you know, Seventh-day Adventists have to hear what I'm saying, you know, I, I'm just putting myself here because the one who has presented this chronology, and that if they reject that, uh, they have closed their probation, right? That, that to me would be a fanatical error. But is chronology definitely a benefit and something that will help people, one, proclaim the message and be solid Seventh-day Adventists? We would say for most people that would be the case. If, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you need to understand the 2300 days and the 70 weeks. And, and the 2520 is a second witness to the 2300 days. And if you're going to understand Millerite history, if you're going to be, if you're going to receive a message that's going to empower the third angel's message, you would need to understand the first and second angel's message, right? I would think so. I would too. But we, what, what's that, William? I was just saying, hey man, do we? Okay. Yeah, but, but we can't say for any individual right now that, you know, if, if I present to them some of my lines, you know, that, that they're being tested. You know, it, it, there's, just, there's just too much involved in, in the individual's experience. And, and I don't know how much of what we do is going to be generally known by Seventh-day Adventists. I think some of it will. But how much will and how what context in which it's going to be presented and how it's going to be understood, I don't have any idea how God's going to use the chronology. But I don't think, you know, that we can attach that, you know, that this is the testing message for Seventh-day Adventists right now, right? But we can see how it's tied to the Sabbath and, and the Sunday law test, right? We should be able to see that. That there is a foundation that was laid. That foundation is Millerite history. The fact that we're understanding Millerite history, I think, is what's really important for Seventh-day Adventists who are going to continue on uh, to be Adventists. I don't see how we can stand in the Sunday law as Seventh-day Adventists if we reject Millerite history, if we believe that the 2300 days uh, was wrong, right? Okay. Do you think there's anyone who's going to stand, any Seventh-day Adventist who's going to stand at the Sunday law who rejects the 2300 days and the 70 weeks? Not stand under Christ's banner, no. No, it, it would be impossible, right? Because if you reject the 2300 days and the 70 weeks, you're not going to stand at the Sunday law, right? So, so we could argue... Uh, that, you know, chronology is important, but what aspects of chronology, a person may not fully understand all of the arguments, but still accept the 2300 days and the 70 weeks based upon uh, their belief in the spirit of prophecy, right? Based upon their personal experience as a Seventh-day Adventist, based upon God working in their life in, in all kinds of ways. So they may not all understand all of the arguments that we are making. They may not have ever seen these studies on 
on Daniel's last vision. They may not understand the significance of the Kazon and the Mara and uh, the Debar and the Mara, right? But they still can stand in the Sunday law. They're still going to accept the 2300 days in the 17 weeks. They're still going to accept those. But for some people who have heard that the 2300 days is there's no basis for it. This message is definitely going to help them in establishing the 2300 days as true for the ones who intellectually that that is an issue, right? For some people, it, it's not going to be an intellectual issue because uh, they don't necessarily understand the chronology. Can we agree with me on that one? Okay. Right? So, so some people might have a hard time with that. They might say, well, how can you accept the 2300 days if you don't understand uh, the chronology? Well, some people will just accept it on faith based upon other things in their experience. But I still think there are many Seventh-day Adventists who won't be able to do that on, just on, on, on its own, right? You could say, well, maybe that every Seventh-day Adventist just needs to accept what Ellen White says. And if you've had an experience with God and you know Christ and you've been obeying his voice, you're, you're just not going to care about you know, what happened in 457 BC. You'll just accept the 2300 days. But but I think that, that for many Adventists, that's not going to be the case. I think it's because I guess the issue, the issue of something being a test is we can know God's voice, right? How do we know God's voice? Like somebody says, well, I just listened to God's voice. How do we know God's voice? The word of God. Okay. That means it has to be established upon the word of God, right? God's voice to us, we can say that God speaks to us through nature, and that's true. But it always has to agree with the written word. That is, the word of God is living, you know, and powerful, right? It, it cuts both ways. It, it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of, of the heart. It's the thing that brings the conviction. It, it reveals Christ. And so there are people... You know, who say, well, I just listened to God's voice. But that voice that they think is God's voice is not founded upon the word of God and will often contradict the word of God. We know people like that, right? God doesn't, God tells them, you know, Sunday's the Sabbath. God tells them, you know, that when you die, you know, you go to hell and you're going to burn there for eternity, right? There's people who hear God's voice in quotation marks. Tell them things that are contrary to God's word. So we know it's not God's voice. So everything has to be founded upon God's word. Yeah, when we hear God's voice speaking, it always takes us, uh, brings thoughts of of the Bible to mind. And in, in my experience, like even just as simple as the lesson book of nature, which was mentioned, reading that book brings me to the word of God, like driving by a, pond and the early morning sun is starting to heat the water and there's a wisp mm -hmm. of vapor coming up when i saw that i remember that day particularly because it it cemented in my mind the verse about our life being as a as a vapor upon the earth that that our lives are so that short and when i saw that i went that's a really good illustration of how short our lives are so yeah when when we say we're God speaking to us, it's always got to be in agreement with his word. Yeah. Well, yesterday I went for a ride on the Great Ocean Road. I had a bit of a holiday yesterday. And um, this is uh, in Victoria, Australia. And, you know, I, I rarely ever see the ocean because, you know, I live in Alberta and I'm not a traveler. So I've seen, yeah, I've seen the ocean in um White Rock, BC, and I've seen the ocean in uh, Northern California. This was pretty amazing for me, you know, to, to stand on the shore of, of the ocean or on a cliff overlooking the shore, looking uh, south, thinking about how little of the ocean I'm seeing and how big the ocean is and how great God is and how much there is to know and how little we actually know. You know, that for me was one of those, those moments where you feel God's presence. And, and um, you know, so nature speaks to us, the vastness of nature. And it speaks to us of the God of the Bible. And God's word is really, really powerful. Reading God's word transforms the human being. It changes our desires. It changes our perspective. 
It lifts us above this world. And the truth of Scripture, every truth of Scripture is valuable, right? When somebody tries to say, well, you know, I, I only think the New Testament is important. It is, does that even make sense? Like, if you, if you can only read the New Testament and you can't read the Old Testament, and you think it's not God's Word, you, you're reading the Bible through human eyes, from a human perspective, from your own nature. You're not letting God's Word speak to you. Now, if we compare the Scripture and nature, there could be somebody who stands on that cliff and looks over the, the South Pacific towards um, Antarctica, and all they see is water, and they don't see God, right? And, and they, you know, they're naturalists, and they think, you know, they could think, well, this is a pretty amazing, you know, we're on this, this speck in this giant universe, and we're insignificant, right? And, and the different perspective there, right? So, you know, we're on this little speck, and, and so we're not really important. But when you see God, when you stand on, you know, looking at the South Pacific towards Antarctica, which you can't see because Earth is a sphere, and you see how, how big things is, big things are, you see how significant you really are to God, right? You understand the difference? Yeah, like standing in the middle of the Rocky Mountains with no ambient light, looking up at the stars, and yeah, God is God is so big. God is close to you. God's close to you, isn't He? Uh, yeah, so big and so close. It's overwhelming. Yeah. yeah. So, so the truths of Scripture, all of Scripture, should bring us to this realization of, in a sense, you know, we could say we're insignificant. And, and, and we are. But God makes us significant because God loves what us. Is man, what is man that thou dost think of him? Yeah, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Mindful of him, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so we just, but, but that's, that's, that's a rhetorical statement because we know God is mindful of us. You know, you, you understand what I'm saying there? You know? Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The psalmist is basically so, remarking on it. On the fact that God is thinking on man, how can He think yeah, on exactly. us? Because we are so small, <laughs> insignificant. Yeah, in, yeah. in the universe yeah. so, and can, on scale. But of course, we know our value. You can look at the human body and, tell, and look at the human body and realize that it ain't no other organism in the world is built like we are. And you know that it is a God behind it because you it, you can't bring that together unless you are. You know, I mean, you can't bring the human body together. The eye itself is without the, without the eye, you can't see. <laughs> yeah. The well, and, the, and the fact that you know God has made us so that we can see light, and you know, in certain certain part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we call visible light, and um, just you know, this amazing creation. But if you if you can if you can't see in the words of scripture god speaking to you you are blind and if you you pick and choose what you want from scripture you're you're rejecting light that god wants to give you so i know this is you know sort of you know not the topic but when we look at the word vision right when we think about the word vision and i saw we have we have these different visions and god is giving us light through these prophecies a vision is a revelation of God's character. So people who reject the prophetic periods are rejecting light. Actually, they're rejecting the ability to see. So if we look at, um, just to kind of tie this together, so if we go to the Laodicean message, the so Revelation chapter 3, we know that the problem that Seventh-day Adventists have is we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, right? That's how we see ourselves. Say, I'm rich and increased with goods and need of nothing. And we do not rich, know. Rich, know not. rich and increased rich and increased with goods of truth. The uh, think Adventists would think that way. Yeah, we, we know everything, right? We got, we got the doctrines, right? But we, we think we have need of nothing. We think we understand the truth. But we don't recognize 
that were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And when you look at the blind part of this, we don't understand the prophetic periods. We don't understand the visions of Daniel. We don't recognize that we don't see. And so one of the things that we have to do, of course, you know, there, it has to do with being the gold tried in the fire. We need to go through some trials, right? And, and tell you would make some comments on the videos regarding, you know, purged, made white, and tried, right? Remember that? What we could show ago, right? And I made a comment on it, right? So there's these different, um, yeah. So, so we know that we need this, uh, gold tried in the fire. We need the white raiment. We can be clothed with the shame of by nakedness does not appear. But we have to anoint our eyes with eye salve that we may see. So we need to have this vision, right? Now, when we look at these, these are sort of in reverse. If we're going to take these as the three angels messages, the eye salve, that's really the first angels message. Uh, the white raiment, that's the sanctification, right? So the justification, sanctification, and then the glorification comes with this bold tried in the fire. I mean, you know, if we're going to take these, that's the way we look at it in Daniel chapter 11, verse 35, right? So in Daniel 11, verse 35, uh, we have a this, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge them, and to make them white. Um, so this is referring to the angels' messages in, in Millwright history. Now, they put a try first. We know in Daniel 11, verse, um, Daniel 12, pardon me, verse 10, many shall be purified, be white, and tried. And so the try is really the third step. Gold tried in fire, which is the first, the same, this is the reverse order. And, and so we've gone into that before. So I know our time is almost up here. So, Dwight, any thoughts? At this point, I think we have we we've covered some interesting ground based on on where we started today. So, as we are now at the end of our time together, if anyone has any other thought or comment, then let's do it. Let let's address it now. Do you have any thoughts about this, Dwight? I mean, I've been talking. You're the one leading now, but is this, is this fitting together for you? Yes, yeah, there's there there's a lot of this. I mean, some of the some of the comments that were made earlier in looking at this it, as far as the three different visions and how this can symbolize the three steps through the the three and the four steps through the sanctuary are very much in line with what what you've been addressing over the last thirty minutes. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to look at how these things work how these are giving us these steps through the sanctuary so that we may better be able to explain this portion of our understanding. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, and, 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 that's, and the other part, too, dealing with this mirror, right? Isaiah, you know, chapter 8, verse 1. You right. know, this, all of these prophetic periods, these visions are this mirror, and that's, of course, the Mara. Right? That's the looking glass. So we can see that in our history, the looking glass vision, this revelation of Christ through the prophetic periods, this vision, the anointing our eyes with eye salves, right? this, this remedy to lay the seams, it, it, it is essential. You know? So, I mean, at some point, all of this comes together to be a testing message right. for, for lay the seams. There is, there is a message that Laodiceans need to receive in order to stand at the Sunday law. But it's much broader than, you know, something I could present, right, or any of us could present as individuals. But God has his message throughout, throughout the world in all of its different facets, in all of its different details, through all of his ministers that he has prepared, the 7,000 that have not bowed the knee unto Baal that we're going to see a revelation of Christ on a worldwide scale, not done through human machinery, not done through some man-made organization, but through the power of the Holy Spirit speaking to the individual parts of the body of Christ throughout the world in a way that we just cannot imagine. And, and I think it would be uh, hubris 
to sort of think that, but what we've done in our studies here, this is the light for Seventh-day Adventists. This is the testing message and that we are the only people on earth that God is using right now to bring light to Seventh-day Adventists. But people get those types of ideas in their heads, right? God gives them a little bit of light and, and they think that this is the whole message. I run into these people all of the time and we are, if I want to make the parallel to Isaac Newton, Right now, where I'm at is Newton's Road here in uh, uh, Little River, Little River, Victoria. And, um, you know, Newton says, you know, I was standing, I'm just like a child playing on the shore, right? Noticing like a stick or a little pebble, I can't remember his exact words, um, and examining these things. But the great ocean of truth lay beyond, unknown. And so we can sometimes imagine that we know so much because we find and discover something on, on the shore of, of the ocean of truth, but yet there is something so much greater than any of us. And, and we need to recognize that. If God is using us, it's true, just like he used Isaac Newton in the realm of science, but we know so little. And we can see we've uncovered many things that have been hidden to us, but God is revealing those things to us because we need it. And other people, People may need some of these things as well, but we can't imagine that, that this is all. And I think this is an extremely important point to recognize that God is the one who takes the work into his hands. He is the one who, whose glory is going to be seen upon his people. It's not going to be seen man's glory that's seen upon him. And that we have been so foolish as a movement to believe that we know what the truth is, and that if somebody doesn't agree with us, that we're just going to cut them out and close their probation as if we are the judge. We are fools. But we need to see it. And if we study God's word properly, that's what we're going to see. We're not going to be exalted. We're going to be abased through the study of God's word. And Christ is going to be exalted, not man. And for us to say, what I'm presenting is the testing truth for you. Uh, to me, that's blasphemy. Okay. We're putting ourselves in the place. <clears throat> just, to comment, just to comment on that, what you were saying, Theodore, is uh, that having been around so long in the church, having seen all the different movements come and go, mm -hmm. and, and, and what the characteristics you mentioned are, are common among every one of them. And thinking that we have all the light leads us into darkness. Mm -hmm. Knowing our true condition leads us to light and humility. And there is something that this is going on. Like people are, people are leaving the church thinking that the church is in apostasy so bad that God can never, that God is rejecting the church, the, the seventh day Adventist church. And that's, that's leading a lot of people into great darkness, I think. Yes. And I, I believe that, you know, what we have presented, what God has given us, the light that he's given us regarding these lines, it, it should encourage us that God has light for his people still, and that those that are going to rejoice in this light, um, not just what we're presenting, but what the light that God is unfolding all over the world, that there's going to be Seventh-day Advent is standing for the truth, and we need to trust that. Now, we know God's passed by the organization, but, but, but for many people who are condemning the church, uh, they got three fingers pointing at themselves as they're pointing at the church, right? And they can't see it. And I just keep seeing these people going into darkness time and time again. You've seen it, Kelly, right? People believing that, you know, the church is the yeah. apostasy and they have a message. Yeah. And they just they just go and almost overnight, and, just, just, and overnight amazing amazing changes of a person who has been a Seventh Day Adventist raised in the schools all their life, etc. In less than three days of watching videos on YouTube about the Lunar Sabbath, all of a sudden they are no longer Seventh Day Adventists in three days. Uh, it's yeah. just amazing. And, and I see it happen. And, you know, and somebody could say, well, you know, your movement's no different than any other ones, because we've seen many people who've accepted, you know, the 2520, and they've gone off into darkness. 
right? So, I mean, a person could argue, you know, that point. But I would say that, um, you know, there is light, but how we respond to that light is the biggest issue. And so sometimes people even have truth, but it leads them into darkness because of how they receive that light. It's, it's a way of judging others. And that can be, you know, people who become seven day Adventists and accept the Sabbath and go farther away from the truth, even though they accepted the Sabbath, because they're self-righteous and, and condemning and critical and, and so forth. So the question is, this truth that we receive, how is it going to affect us? Are we really going to be changed? Are we going to really receive the Mara vision, that looking glass vision? And are we going to behold our face in that glass and turn away and forget what manner of man we were? Or are we going to go from glory to glory, right? Are we going to look into that law of liberty and, and behold Christ and, and see the remedy that's being provided for us? I mean, this is really the whole issue. All right. Is the truth going to change us? Yeah, I know we're way over time. <laughs> we're going to return to a lot of this tomorrow, but I, you know, I don't disagree with much of what is said. So shall we now close our meeting with a word of prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together today. Direct us through this day. Be with us, we ask. Show us how we may more, more properly glorify you. Direct us to this end. For this we ask and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.